I always felt that having my grandparents around me is very important. Um, I knew that she hadn't spoken about the Holocaust much in her history, in her past, her family. And she always told me and my sister, like, whatever you want to do, pick up the phone and say, listen, Granny, can I speak to you about something? Um, in school, whenever, and whenever a teacher would ask, if any of you have a Holocaust survivor in your family, I would raise my hand straight away and tell them the story. My dad had a shoe factory, so we lived very well, had an apartment in a very nice part of the city. We were a family of two parents and four children. An older brother, myself, then there was a younger brother and a little sister. She was very bright and very pretty, very beautiful, and she adored me. I was the hero. My older brother was uh, physically handicapped. He was damaged during birth and he couldn't walk, but there was nothing wrong with him mentally. 1st of September, we were coming back to school. We were coming back from vacation. The whole family and the, all the coffers with the stuff and, and the helpers and everybody was on the train. And the train was full, everybody was panicking and wanted to be at home when the war started. Within eight days, they came to the, to the town. I mean, the Poles were fighting with, with... They didn't have any defense. They had sabers. And these were big tanks, and the army went like, you know, the German army was organized. They, they, were, in, they were within 14, I think, I don't remember the days, but within, I think, 14 days, they occupied half of Poland. They were wearing these black uniforms with a skull on top and and they installed loudspeakers all over the town, spreading hate propaganda and Hitler's speeches went on for hours and hours. So if somebody says that they didn't know what was going on, that was impossible whether they liked it or not because he never made any secrets of what he was going to do to the Jews. We had white armbands with a blue, <clears throat> the smug and David, the, the, the star of David, yeah. At that time and all the time afterwards, I, I looked not like a Jewish girl. I looked like the advert of Goebbels for a German Every second German stopped me in the street. Why are you wearing this? <clears throat> they didn't see a Jew looking like this. They had all these propaganda pictures picturing Jewish people like they looked like monkeys. I've never seen anybody like this. And looking like animals, not like people. My dad was still working. They didn't pay him, but he had a collection of gold, of gold um, rubles. And that saw us through a lot. Uh, the, the ghetto was established in 41. There were 30,000 people. They had two, two ghettos there, and the one that we were in was called the big ghetto. But it was really a small um, place. It was around the, the Jewish quarters where the synagogue was. Ten people in a room. I was. There were terrible, terrible conditions. They would come and knock on doors and take people out and shoot them there and then, and they would do the most terrible things. And they used to send people to work. Up to now, we survived because of my father's job that he had. My mother worked in, 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 a, in another place there, but my older brother was still with us and my little sister was with us. Not for long. My younger brother was taken to the, 
to the armament factory. We never knew what happened to him during the war. We never saw him till the end of the war, and, and two years later, after the end of the war, and he never talked about it. His own family doesn't know where he was, what he did. In 1942, there was, they took out, out of the 30,000, they took 20,000 people out of the ghetto and they had to stand there and most of them went straight to the death camps. And the small ghettos, they shot everybody and, and some other people had to bury them in mass graves. I had to get to work at that stage because if not, they would, would have deported me with the next lot. Uh, I had an um, a abscess on my tooth that was supposed to be filled and had a temporary filling, but there wasn't a dentist in town anymore. So I, I developed a big abscess here and I was going to the hospital to to lance it or to do something. And my uncle who lived with us there, it was a small little place, um, helped to dress me. It was winter, it was very cold. And he pressed on this and as a result, it burst. So my mother said, you don't have to go to the hospital now because we, we, we will treat it ourselves. And that same morning, they took or everybody from the hospital and they killed everybody. And my brother went to the hospital, but they shot all the people that were physically disabled. He knew exactly what was happening. He wasn't mentally uh, retarded, he was bright. And he said, he took off his winter coat and he gave it to my mother and he says, give it to someone who will need it. I won't need it anymore and she came home with a coat. It was March 1944, they closed that little ghetto and we were the last remnant of that, that place. And, uh, and they marched us to the railway station. There were no other Jews from 30,000. They were the last 300. It was our first concentration camp and the trip was as they describe in a cattle truck, no ventilation, no water, no toilet facilities, tiny little window and packed people on his standing place and they locked the doors, no light, no nothing and from Radom we were taken to the first concentration camp which was Majdanek just outside Lublin. We were um, having one little suitcase each, and we arrived in, in Majdanek, and it was dismal. Everything was stripped. You had to strip naked in the snow, and they were standing there in full uniform, looking you up and down. Then they sent you to the, to the showers, and then you were given a wooden pair of sort of shoes, they were not shoes, but they had material on top and a thick wooden sole like that. And a striped uniform, a striped dress and a white handkerchief on the, on the head. And that was all you had in this winter, freezing cold weather. And there, for the first time, we saw the women assess. And in a way, they were, they were terribly cruel. They were, they were awful women. I don't know where they get women with such hatred in them. For what? There were five different camps in, in Majdanek. The fifth um, camp was a crematorium. We were totally separated from the men, so we didn't know where my father was and what he was doing. Six weeks in Majdanek. And then they sent us somewhere else, the same story, with the um, cattle trucks, with the closed wagons, no air, no anything, and we went to the next camp, which was Plashov.
They had an enormous camp there. My mother was sent to another camp and I had a friend. Most of the people there were from Krakow and from the, the vicinity of Krakow, which was a big, big country there, the whole south of, of Poland. It was a big camp and in charge of it was this horrible man that was depicted in the film, Schindler's List. Uh, it, I think it was the best film that portrayed that camp. That was the camp where it, where it took place. And he was sitting there amusing himself by shooting at people. If he didn't like somebody, he shot them. And they divided us into groups of ten. So, uh, like the Romans, ten women, ten, ten in a team, and we had to push these terribly heavy and difficult wagons to, on, on the rails to, this, to, to take the stones to the quarry. It was a hell of a job, we could, we could hardly manage. And there were shootings and hangings and there was no crematorium there. Only a hill where they used to burn the people and all the ashes used to fly over us. Every day we had this, this, these ashes flying over us and we knew it was from the hill where they were burning the bodies. Doesn't matter, stand and wait for them to come and count us about eight, half past eight. And you had to stand to attention for hours in this freezing weather. And one day, um, the woman chief of the SS women, her name was Elsa Erich, and she had the most steely eyes. I've never seen such cold eyes in my life. And they were wearing a uniform with a divided skirt and a, like a, a, not a hat, but a, like a little army sort of cap without a thing, like the soldiers used to wear. And they were, in many ways, they were worse than the men. They were terribly cruel. And this particular Elsa took delight in punishing children or, or hitting them or sending them off somewhere and then she was worse than, than anybody. She was, she was not normal. Uh, she was like a wild animal. She was a terrible woman. Anyway, she was looking for a, 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 um, a helper in the house, a domestic servant. And of all these thousands of people, she picked me. Maybe because I didn't look Jewish, maybe because, I don't know, I have no idea. How old are you? 18. Where are you from? From there. And I could speak German, obviously. There, were, there was the head, the, this Elsa Erich, then there were two young uh, SS women. The one was called Mindel, and the other was called Two Stitch. The uh, Mindel girl was from a farm up north, and she was taking pictures of me to send home that the Jews don't look all luck in the pictures. The soldiers in Russia needed blood. Who do you think they took it from? The prisoners in the camps. So they used to raid on a Sunday when nobody was working, just resting. They used to come to the barrack and empty a barrack and take them to the Red Cross. There was a Red Cross part and take blood from them as much as they could, not just one pint or half a pint, but a lot of people died because they didn't have food or, or liquid to replace the blood. And one, one morning I was lying on the top uh, bunk and trying to rest a bit from the heavy work and there is the raid. So first comes the SS with a, with a red cross on his arm with two guards and they're emptying the whole barrack. People are trying to run away. The women knew what was waiting for them if he came from the, from the Red Cross barrack. But it was like a death sentence because it was very difficult to recover from this when they emptied you of blood. And um, so, he, and I was thinking, what do I have to do? There is no other entrance, only this door that they came in and they had two guards there. So there's no ways I can go through the, through the door and try and escape. And all the women that tried to escape through the window, it was impossible, you couldn't. So I stayed on, the, on that top bunk and I didn't move. 
what, what will be, will be. So they all emptied the whole barrack, and this as, as men noticed that I was still there. So he comes to the bed and he says, what's wrong with you? Why aren't you there? So I said, I've got typhus, which wasn't truth. I didn't have typhus, I didn't have anything. So he puts his hand on my forehead and it's as cold as a cucumber. So he says, really? So I said, yes. So he left me and he went. So that was another escape. My father was killed there. And, and he was an upright citizen. He was always fair with his workers. He couldn't, couldn't come to terms with this whole situation. And his family was dispersed. He didn't know where and what. And the, the child was gone, and my mother was gone to another camp. And he was killed by one of the couple, one of the overseers there. He was beaten to death. And then from Plashov, we were sent to Auschwitz. And that was an experience. Uh, just before Yom Kippur, in October, it was rare, it was snowing, it was freezing cold. It was nearly the end of the war. It was 1944. And I met my mother there at Birkenau and my friend, my best friend from, from Poland was there in Birkenau and they both came running to me, but they were really, they were very hungry. I was very happy that they're alive. That's the first thought. My mother was sent to another camp. I was sent with another hundred young girls to the proper camp, Auschwitz, to the, it was called Musterlager. They took us off the train and we had to line up and again strip and this, and this terrible, and the men were separated, were separated from the women immediately. Women and children on one side and the men on the other side. And they stood, Dr. Mengele and his cronies, fully dressed in uniforms, and we had to parade in front of them. You can imagine what that, that felt like. And he was just flicking his finger. If he flicked the finger to the left, the people were going to the, straight to the crematorium. If to the right, they were going to the camp. So, we were sorted, sorted out, in inverted commas, that way. And those that um, were strong enough to work, or then they sent them to the proper Auschwitz. My sister wasn't there. My sister was already gone with the children's transport. So the mothers were there crying, and the fathers, and everybody stood on the on the platz where they counted us and they had loud music blaring over the loudspeakers when they took all the children away. And we knew they were going, I mean, where could they take children? She was sent into the ovens. The children were singing when they left. We're given a number, everybody gets tattooed. There's mine still, I wouldn't let them remove it after the war. They came to shave every woman's head. And they're also divided in groups of 10. I cannot describe to you how a girl looks without hair and this is, this is the last thing they were sort of holding on to. The woman with the, came to cut my hair. The German SS woman has a look around and she looks and she looks, ah, ah, stop, don't cut her hair. I was the only one that didn't have the hair shaved, just cut shorter. It was a matter of surviving every minute. And it was for me because, okay, they didn't cut my hair, but then every one of us got a bundle of clothes. And they were not these striped clothes, they were civilian clothes. 
and uh, you know they took it from the people obviously that they were there that were killed before and I got a parcel of clothes I was told by then that would have fitted a 12 year old girl and the shoes were these uh, so then my luck ended the clogs the, these uh, clogs that they wear in Holland you know those wooden the clogs wooden. But they were too small, I couldn't put my foot into them. So I thought to myself, now th this is the end. They didn't cut my hair, but they'll bury me now with my, they'll burn me with my hair. As I stood there in the courtyard and I'd cry, and I, I don't know how I'm going to survive here in these clothes. I couldn't wear these shoes, stood in the snow, in a ma micro mini dress, nothing on my head. And in the middle of my tears, and this is as true as I sit here, I hear a voice calling my name. So I can't see who it is because my tears are all over my face and my eyes. And on the other side of the, of the fence, there were, there were, a young chap was standing and calling my name. So he says, come to the fence. So I'm coming near the fence and he says, wait right here for five minutes, wait. So I said, who are you? You know, what you're doing, who are you? So he says, never mind who I am, I'm in a hurry, I used to work for your dad. So he recognized me, but I didn't know who he was. I had no idea, he was a Jewish chap, and he went away and he came back. He was working with the clothes of the dead people that they just killed, um, and the ovens, and they guessed them. So he came back and he threw over the fence a parcel for me with clothes. And this was, this was a life saver. I'll never forget what was in, the, in that parcel because this, now I know that I can carry on. There were wonderful shoes with laces, leather shoes. There were stockings, there was underwear, there was a warm dress and a black velvet coat. The worst thing I remember from Auschwitz was the cold, the freezing cold that used to stand for hours outside and without any purpose, pushing these stones from one place to another. And uh, some people recited poems, that was my job, because I, we had to learn everything of by heart in those days. And so we kept our minds sort of away from this horrible presence. You had to have a, a, a break from it. Hunger is a terrible thing. It's not just being hungry that you come home and, and eat. It's starvation. There's nothing the next day, there's nothing the following day, and you feel weaker and you look like, like a skeleton. It's a, it's a horrible, horrible feeling. The medical block I did see because we had two girls from my town who had identical twins and they were very pretty, but you couldn't tell the difference between the one and the other. And he, get, he had them there up in the, in the experimental block and then we saw the girls upstairs in that uh, experimental block and I still say, you're lucky, you're warm there, and we sit in the frost and we're absolutely freezing. So she still, I never forget it. She said, don't envy us. On the 10th of December is my birthday. I would have had a big party and I would have getting ready for university. I was put down to go to Rome, to Italy, to study. And now I'm sitting in Auschwitz and I don't know what tomorrow will be. I had my future mapped up and it was a lot. And I said, I'm too young to die. I can't die. I'm too young. I haven't seen anything. I haven't done anything yet. So I've lost everything, but I'm too young to die. I don't want to die. So there was about three months altogether in Auschwitz. And then they evacuated. Can you imagine? The Russians came, I think, two days after we left. And why are we being marched to another concentration camp? Why? 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 This, that question never, ever left me. 
and uh, there were lots of people being killed on the way, just shot because they couldn't walk anymore. The road on both sides was just full of dead bodies and the snow was red. was the biggest shock I've ever had since the beginning of the war. I saw plenty of people dying, being shot, being hanged, being punished, being tortured, but I've never seen a sight like this when we came to the gates of Bergen-Belsen. A huge mountain of dead bodies was in front, right to the left of the gate. But if I say huge, it was huge, partly decomposing. That was our, our first impression of Bergen-Belsen. Remember the shock of the conditions that even by standards of Auschwitz, this was the pits. I was clean and free of any vermin till I arrived in Bergen-Belsen, and then you couldn't help it. I got sick with typhus. There was no work to do because there was no work, there was nothing to do. There were hundreds of people, there were Russian prisoners, there were Poles just sitting and dying. They were, they were sitting and starving and didn't have strength to get up. There was a girl next to me, a Hungarian girl, and all she, she, she could, could say in a broken German was, I don't want to die, I don't want to die. So I, I, I still said to him, then stop shouting, preserve your energy. <laughs> don't shout all the time. She was shouting, I don't want to die until she died. And people were being burned and people are being shot. And there was no order. It was just, ran, you know, at, prisoners had to carry the, the corpses to where they were burning them. But we didn't budge from that one big hall. And eventually that hall was nearly empty. I'm not going to die. I'm too young to die. That was a mantra that I was repeating all the time. I have just returned from the Belsen concentration camp. But beyond the barrier was a whirling cloud of dust the dust of thousands of slowly moving people, laden in itself with the deadly typhus germ. And with the dust was a smell, sickly and thick, the smell of death and decay, of corruption and filth. I passed through the barrier and found myself in the world of a nightmare. Dead bodies, some of them in decay, lay strewn about the road and along the rutted tracks. On each side of the road were brown wooden huts. There were faces at the windows, the bony, emaciated faces of starving women too weak to come outside, propping themselves against the glass to see the daylight before they died. But there were no, not enough doctors and they established a, a hospital outside the camp. And yes, and the one thing that annoyed us most of all was that we were closed in the camp and we were not allowed to go out because they didn't want the neighborhood to get all these diseases. That means the Germans or the, the people that lived around us. So they locked us into the, in the camp and we were not allowed to come out. But they didn't have enough doctors, they didn't have medicines, they had nothing, and they didn't have suitable food for all these people. They were starving and they fed them on this fat, fat meat and, and things, and people got sick all over again. And the people were dying, there were 30,000 people that died after the liberation. I felt terrible, I lost the only friend I had right through the through the camps when I was separated from my mother and from my whole family. And she, she looked after me. She was an intelligent, bright girl. We always had talks about what we learned at school. She studied French and I studied German. We compared notes. It was terrible. And I heard that most of the people that survived from Radom were in Stuttgart. 
So I went by train, a friend came to fetch me and we went back to, we went to Stuttgart. And there I met, my mother came from Poland, so I met her there for the first time after the war. So it was very tearful, but it was happy in a way too that the two of us at least survived. The, the times after the war were very difficult. You had to start rebuilding your life. You had to deal with all the, the, the past, the terrible past, with all the losses that we, you know, we didn't have time to deal with it while we were in the camps. But after the war was finished, then we started to think of all the things that happened to us and there were no psychologists, there were no psychiatrists, there was no help and we had to work it all out by ourselves. But then my uncle in Paris, and he knew that we were there, so he sent for us. Everybody there in France was busy building their lives from the beginning again after the war, and sort of, in a way, recovering, recuperating, but it wasn't a future. I knew that this wasn't our future. And then we had to find my brother. We didn't know where he was. Eventually, we found out from the family that he's in Israel already. There was an American woman from the Vitzo, from the Zionist organization, who gathered she collected a lot of young uh, children and young youngsters, teenagers from the, that survived the camps and she brought them to Israel. He was a teenager still. I can't remember, he was about, that was already one year after the liberation and then it was two years after the liberation. He wasn't 20 yet. And uh, he was taken to this kibbutz on Lake Hulata for two years he stayed and worked on this kibbutz. And then we spent two years in France living with my uncle and and uh, until one of my uncles in, in Palestine, he organized two false passports for us, for me and for my mother. We were determined to to get to Palestine because that's where the rest of the family was. So we had to get to Marseille, and there was a camp of the, all the Jewish refugees. Some were trying to get illegally to Israel, and, uh, and we helped pack this famous boat, Exodus. I was in Marseille at the time, and a couple of us who were in the camp went to there were about a thousand, I think about a thousand people on that boat and that was the famous book and the picture that they made of this boat that came to Palestine and they, they wouldn't let them in. We eventually we went um, in a little Greek boat. It wasn't a very, very big boat, but it was a nice, comfortable boat. And we arrived in Haifa. My little brother was six foot tall by the time we met him and we could hardly recognize him. He didn't meet us in Haifa, he couldn't come. But uh, soon afterwards, the War of Independence broke out in 48 straight away. And then I went to the, to the army for two years and then a year later, my brother went into the armies. It was just a matter of get hold of yourself and get on. The time in Israel was a healing process. Financially, we were very poor, we didn't have much, but as soon as the state was announced, my mother opened a canteen at the police station in Haifa. And she was doing very well there. We were very close, but it was a rule in the house, we're not talking about the camps. I, no, I had a, a bad time with my nerves. There were times that I couldn't cope with everything. And um, he was different. He was quiet. He wasn't noisy like the 
Mediterranean people, and uh, he loved music, which I also did. A lot of things, and we spoke Hebrew. He could, I couldn't speak English. I took her out a few times before I really f fell for her in a big way. And um, he never let me go. <laughs> he, f he found, he went out, and my mother still looked. He came with two little nylon shirts that were washed every day, and she couldn't get over it how poor he looked. And where, you know, what, what is it? He, he looked really funny. We got to know each other better. I, I proposed to her and read, and she she agreed to marry me. So I told, so I had to do something in order to to maintain her friendship and be there all the time. So I had to take a job in Israel in Haifa, and uh, I stayed there for six months. That's just to be close to Enya. I was completely smitten then. We didn't go out for a long time, about three or four months, and then we got married, and I said I'll come to South Africa for one year only to meet the family, and then I'll go back home. Well, that never happened. When we arrived in Bloemfontein, it was on a cold winter's morning. It was freezing cold, and I'm coming from this hot climate in, 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 in Israel, and it was grim. Uh, all the smoke from all the chimneys were coming up, and the station was so miserable, and the town looked like a little hick town, like a little village. And I had to get a taxi to take us to my parents home. I look around and I said to Morris, are you sure you didn't miss the station? Is that the place that we came? No, he says, this is Bloemfontein. <laughs> Dead silence. <laughs> I wanted to go right back into the train and, and go back. And I, she, I brought her to a land where, where Eng, English was the language and she couldn't speak English. The problem was to get her to, to teach her how to speak English. And I stayed for 42 years. Eventually I became a principal of the school and I carried on. While I was courting her, she told me she had been a... Um, a Holocaust survivor. As a, um, a bit of a shock, you know, to, to hear about what had happened to her. I wanted children, I really did. Even in the, during the war, I always said to myself, I haven't lived yet, I, I don't know anything about anything. I want, I want children. I want to make up for all those millions of children that were killed, murdered. We were aware of what happened. We were aware of which family members we had lost. We knew this was always in the background, but the detail we didn't know. I didn't talk about the Holocaust to my sons, not to my husband. Over time in the in the in the concentration camps, she often had nightmares and she woke up screaming, and I had to sort of uh, console her and and, uh, and try to settle her down at, at, uh, during the, during the nights. My 24-year-old son, Richard, when he was still at school, I think he was 17 years of age, he had the privilege of going on the March of the Living. And uh, he went uh, first to Israel, and then he went to the various camps that my mother had been in. And it was quite poignant because he celebrated his 17th birthday at Maidanik, which is where my mother had her 17th birthday. So she was there as an inmate, and he was there as a visitor to, 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 to see where she had been. And then subsequently, I think he also, I forget the exact sequence, but he also uh, visited um, uh, Auschwitz, the Camp Auschwitz, which I think is, is, is better preserved. And 
I subsequently heard that he phoned his grandmother and said, well, I'm standing at the, at the, at the gates of Auschwitz. Uh, where were you in Auschwitz? And she said, I will direct you to the bungalow. And uh, he was able to, on the cell phone, get directions to where his grandmother had been within the camp. I didn't want to influence their lives with my past and my suffering. If they asked a question, I answered it, but I never discussed it. And I could hear everywhere people talking about second generation syndrome of the Holocaust, and the kids were affected if the parents both were in the camps and never stopped talking about it. And I didn't want them to grow up with any complexes. I don't know if I made a mistake or not, but that's how it was. She gave me a birthday present. She said, you know what the best birthday present I ever received? And I always thought at that age, what was it? Was it a jersey? Was it a sweatshirt? Was it this? And she said, no, it was a piece of bread. And I don't know if she told you the story of one day in the Holocaust where it was a birthday and her closest friend had disappeared for the whole day. And she was cross with her friend um, because she wanted her friend to spend time with her in the camp. And it was freezing and it was cold and her friend completely disappeared. And at six o'clock at night, the friend came back and said, yeah, I've been working in the labor environment to earn you an extra piece of bread for your birthday. Yeah, as your birthday present. And I think for me, that was the most telling story that she told me at my early days of, of manhood. That little story made me realize the values of life. Um, and still I tell my children today when it comes to that, that presents and gifts are not real gifts, but it's a gift of love and it's a gift of just being yourself and enjoying life. And that one story st stood with me and still sticks with me today as the one little lesson of many thousands one can learn from the concentration camps. And, and you know, sometimes I wonder myself, was I there? Was it truth? Was I really there in that time at, uh, in such places and lived through all these things? It can't be, it can't be, but it is. She came out of it, she started a new family, she started a new life, and she decided to give new messages. There are lots of stories to tell, and they're so vivid. And I want to say that I'm just, say that I'm just, it's so crazy about her, and and I still want to be with her. And uh... I'm not a hero. I don't want to be remembered for anything special. Just a good mother and a grandmother, and a friend.